Hey, how are you doing? Good to see you. Let's talk about an epidemic. We're in the middle of one, you know. Uh, people are getting hooked on wrath. <laughs> They're taking what I call wrath amphetamines, and uh, it's a dangerous epidemic. It's leading to some pretty dangerous trends. You know, this podcast is Christians in a Cancel Culture, uh, meaning how do we as believers uh, respond to a culture which is trying to cancel opposing voices. That's what cancel culture is about. It's about silencing opposing views. It's about not tolerating opposing views. Uh, the Christian church is largely the target of cancel culture, but we are certainly not the only target. Uh, secular conservative voices are often targeted by cancel culture. Uh, Secular patriotic voices are often targeted by cancel culture. And as we speak, why uh, pro-Israel voices are absolutely being targeted by cancel culture and cancel culture's allies. We're seeing that in universities and demonstrations around the country and really around the world. Now, along with the move to silence, you will always find wrath. Wrath. And that's what I want to talk about today. Wrath amphetamines and what we do about them. Uh, first, though, hey, have you subscribed yet? If you haven't, would you consider it? If you like what you're hearing, you want to be a part of this podcast community, I'd love to stay in touch with you personally, keep you updated on projects and events we've got coming up. So uh, hit that bell, subscribe. And if you would, in the comments section, let me know uh, that you subscribe so I can thank you personally, okay? Love to have you be a part of this. Okay, wrath amphetamine. Uh, when I was a kid, I'll say when I was a dumb kid, I did use drugs um, from the time I was 12. And the first drug I used was methamphetamine. I learned to snort meth before I even learned how to smoke pot. And uh, I ran the whole gamut of drug use. But my drug of choice above everything else was methamphetamine. For the first time, I snorted it. I felt that incredible rush that amphetamines deliver, um, the euphoria and and the sense of power and alertness and focus. And oh man, I, I mean, it it was uh, it was functional to me. It it had a medicating effect. I just loved the high that I got with meth. Now I gave up drugs when I came to Christ at age sixteen. Never used them since. I did backslide into sexual sin about seven years after that. Still did not get back on drugs until I discovered, ooh, a new one, wrath amphetamine. I discovered it when I became more of an activist as an openly gay man. I, I remember in the early 80s, um, a lesbian friend and I formed the first gay student union at the city college I attended at the time. And as we formed the union, we ran into opposition, we ran into mockery. I began speaking to human sexuality classes at different colleges and universities in the area. And more and more, as I felt that sense of purpose, I also felt kind of a rage. And with that rage, I felt a lot of power, you know? Um, I felt like we have a purpose. We're forming a gay student union. I am challenging the homophobes. I am a clear voice for righteousness, you know, and, and I, I was really, I guess, getting a bit of a Superman complex at that time because it was such a rush feeling, let's face it, superior. I was more enlightened than the homophobes, than the most of the American public who still disapproved of homosexuality. I was there along with my fellow activists to educate them and to enlighten them and, and, and if need be, to really shut them down if, if they got in uh, our way. There were two things that added to that high that really contributed to it also. Uh, that would be the villain and, and uh, the virtue. The villain, I had to have a villain. If I was going to have a cause, I had to have a villain. And, and the villain I had, I had to make him out to be a little worse than he really was. I mean, basically, the people who opposed us were people who said, hey, I don't think homosexuality is right. I don't think it's normal. Ah, that's not villainous enough. I had to, in my own mind at least, make them out to be sort of gargoyles. We hate gays. We want to see you all dead. We want to beat you up. You know, hardly anybody really said that. Now, that exists to this day. I know that kind of real hatred for gays and lesbians. But by and large, it wasn't fair of me to say that that's how all of my opponents were. But in my mind, for me to get really amped up and wrathed, new word, wrathed, 
um, I had to make them out to be villains worse than they really were. And of course, I had to make my out, myself out to be more virtuous than I really was, the villain and the virtue. I had to be able to tell myself, I'm fighting a just cause. I will be a martyr for that cause. I am, well, I, 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 I was a great Pharisee, wasn't I? Because I really became like that Pharisee Jesus described who went up on a mountain and was praying and uh, said, I thank you, Lord, that I am not like other men. I was basically saying, yeah, I'm glad I'm not like other people. I, uh, I felt an old familiar rush. I used to get it from methamphetamine. Now I was using wrath amphetamine. Self-righteous wrath. It gives you superiority and it gives you purpose. Hey, that is exactly why I think a lot of young people are susceptible to this, you know? Um, they they have a, I think, a healthy need to be a part of something noble. That's good. Good. Um, but I think they're still forming emotionally. Uh, they haven't had sufficient life experience. They they may not have even formed a strong enough philosophical base to determine how they figure out what's true and what's not. So they basically are hungry for a cause, but they're not sure how or don't have the tools to discern whether or not the cause is just. And face it, a lot of people jump on bandwagons without doing their homework. And so they get caught up in the cause. They're very susceptible to this, young people. Um, smart politicians know that. So do influencers. So do tyrants. They know. Get a generation whipped up into a frenzy over a cause and you speak to their need to be a part of something noble and to fight a villain and to be passionate about something, you know? Uh, in George Orwell's classic novel, 1984, Big Brother knew that. The Big Brother government that wanted to totally control the people, they knew, hey, we've got to give the people a cause and a villain. So they created the villain Goldstein, who was the evil person who was behind all the ills of the world and gave the people a sense of nobility. We are the ones who are righteously fighting under the banner of Big Brother. Uh, and so he appealed, the government, I should say, of that time, the totalitarian government appealed to the need for a villain and for virtue and uh, the need to whip people up with wrath amphetamines. Have a look at this movie clip, a uh, film version of 1984, and I think you'll see what I mean. Well, that's something, isn't it? You know, in a way, you got to admit that looks familiar. Haven't we seen that? <clears throat> Whipped up into a frenzy? Uh, we saw wrath amphetamines on full display, just for example, in 2020. The George Floyd riots, the takeovers of cities, the, the vandalism, the absolute physical violence, the... Uh, shutting down even of law enforcement, the impotence of the government to do anything to help the average citizen that was caught up in the middle of that. I mean, wow. You notice the news clips of people in the middle of those sort of wrath-like demonstrations, they weren't articulating anything but wrath. You didn't see them articulating a reason behind their behavior, a reason for the rage that they were expressing. All they expressed was the rage itself. Now, I'm sure some people involved in those uh, mob scenes really believed in what they were doing. There are always true believers in any cause, but I'm also dead certain there were plenty of people coming along for the ride because they were just getting high on wrath, experiencing the rush, you know? Now, today, what are we seeing? Well, it's horrible, isn't it? Uh, we're seeing on major universities around the country, students getting whipped up into an anti-Israel frenzy. Uh, I, I make no bones about being pro-Israel and uh, against Hamas, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not here to really promote that. I'll just express it for clarity's sake. But the point is, a lot of the people getting whipped up into this anti-Israel frenzy, um, I think a lot of them are experiencing what I experienced as a gay uh, activist, the rush that comes from wrath amphetamine. Um, wrath addicts, they, they can be easily swayed. This is nothing new. 
uh, Jesus was the focus of wrath and of addiction to wrath, wasn't he? I mean, there were some true believers who really felt, oh, this guy is blaspheming. He has to be stopped. But the crowds were swayed. You know, one minute they say, hail, Hosanna, Messiah. And then, the, you know, a few days later, it's like, ah, crucify him. You know, people easily swayed by wrath. Paul, uh, when he was in Ephesus and later on when he was in Rome, wow. Uh, there were people, again, true believers who thought this man has to be stopped. But there were also plenty of people who just jumped on the bandwagon and said, oh, yeah, fight, fight, fight. Let's go for it. People are attracted to violence. They're attracted to conflict. They're attracted to being a part of a cause and going along with the tide, and it happens. Now, why is this? Wrath amphetamines, they speak to three very legitimate needs that people have. The need to purge sin, to attain righteousness, and to bring salvation. Now, these are things we cannot do, and yet we feel the need to do them. And I get that. I, I think it's legitimate. It's just that we seek to, to satisfy a legitimate need in the wrong way because we realize it's beyond us. Now, just for example, Cain, the need to purge sin. Anything wrong with saying, hey, I need to make a sacrifice for sin? Absolutely not. What was the problem? He made a sacrifice of his own hands. God rejected it. Okay. Um, and that generated wrath in him, didn't it? Killed his brother who offered a righteous sacrifice. Uh, the Pharisees. They felt a need to attain righteousness. Well, I mean, uh, on the one hand, if, if a person realizes I am not righteous, I need to be righteous, okay, that's good. But if you think you're going to do that on your own, as they did, well, they thought they'd attain righteousness by obeying a lot of rules and regulations and not only keeping the law, but adding to it and adhering to the additions as well. Um, attain righteousness, yeah, they tried to do that on their own. Paul himself felt the need for bringing salvation, didn't he? Oh, there's a problem. These Christians are blaspheming and uh, they're hurting the, the truth and we need to bring salvation by killing them, basically. I mean, he really felt that he was doing God a service and that's what Jesus predicted when he was still uh, on earth physically. Um, you notice all three of these, though. If you try to do them on your own, you try to purge sin, you try to attain righteousness yourself, you try to bring salvation, what do you do there? You bring honor to self, you deny the sinfulness of self, and you bypass God. There's the problem. You bring honor to self, you deny the sinfulness of self, and you bypass God, all because you decided to take things into your own hands out of the need to see sin purged and righteousness established and salvation brought. Uh, if I can purge sin myself, what am I? I'm the Savior. Ooh. My own Savior and the Savior of others. That brings honor to myself. If I can attain righteousness rather than become righteous, which we do become in Christ, if I can attain it, wow, then I earned it. Ooh. You know, the wages of sin is death, but the wages of attaining righteousness are self-righteousness. That feels good. That feels good. And if I can bring salvation through my noble cause, through my passion, even through my, my violent takeover of cities or my silencing of others, if I can do that, ah, no need for God. There's just me. I mean, in all of these cases, there's no need to admit my own helplessness. Certainly no need for humility. Behind wrath amphetamines, there is another epidemic, an epidemic of pride. The pride that comes when people do exactly what Paul said they would do in Romans 1. They did not like to retain God in their mind. Their foolish minds became darkened. In the end, wrath is all about me. And when it's all about me, there is no room for him. No, so what do we do in response to all this uh, you know, as believers? Are we, are we going to just mock these people, um, show contempt to them, despise everything about that? There, there's nothing redemptive in that. Um, we can recognize these needs and at least understand why people feel them so keenly because, number one, we recognize there is such a thing as sin, and it needs to be purged. So good on you for recognizing there is such a thing as wrongdoing, and wrongdoing needs to be dealt with. Good. Glad you recognize that. But um, if you want to address sins like injustice and hate and greed, um, wrath is not going to achieve any kind of an end that is legitimate because you are fighting sin with sin. 
That's a great problem in a lot of the social justice movements. They see something that may be an injustice, and then they fight the injustice with an injustice of their own. That's exactly why James said, James 1.20, the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. It doesn't. All it does is intimidate and overpower, but it does not work righteousness. So yeah, we, we can go right on. I, I agree. Amen. There is such a thing as sin, and it needs to be dealt with. But you don't deal with it through wrath because you are only adding more sin to the existing sin. And yeah, there's also a need for righteousness. Sure, we can recognize we have a need for righteousness, but not to attain it because we can't, but rather than to have it imputed to us to become righteous through no effort of our own. If we try to attain righteousness, the only thing we can achieve is self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is the antithesis of true righteousness. As Jesus said, if somebody thinks they're well, they don't have a need for a physician. If they don't think they have a need for a physician, what's going to happen? They're going to die in their sin. And yes, we recognize a need for salvation. Of course we do. And not just personal salvation. I mean, we, we recognize largely the, the need for things to be set right in the world. So Paul told the Romans in Romans 8, all creation is groaning. It's, you know, we know something is wrong. Things are not uh, as, as they should be. Um, but we can change or enforce laws to maintain order. We can strive for justice, but we cannot change or coerce people. We cannot make people righteous by forcing them, intimidating them, shouting them down. So we recognize the needs behind the wrath a lot of people feel, but we object to the way they are trying to satisfy those needs. We recognize the need, we reject the approach. Um, and that's exactly why we do what we do. We start off by saying, as Paul did to the Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, both Jew and Greek. We preach Jesus because he made a sacrifice for sin. And that is the answer to the sin problem. That releases us from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin. That is the answer to the crying need to do something about sin. He makes us righteous through faith. We cannot attain our own righteousness. We cannot create our own righteousness. We do a terrible job when we become self-righteous in the effort. Righteousness apart from him is impossible. And yes, we preach him because he not only brings personal salvation, but he also will bring ultimate, complete salvation and justice to this earth. Now, we unapologetically, let's fight for justice when something is truly unjust. Let's examine the cause we are a part of. Let's make sure that it is a righteous cause. As believers, let's make sure that we have biblical precedent and rationale for fighting that cause. But absolutely, I think the church has been at her finest at different times when she's fought against evils and, and genuine social injustices. So, hey, there are things we should be angry about. No problem there. But Paul laid it out plainly. Be angry and sin not. If we're going to fight, let's apply justice to the way we fight. Personally, I look at a lot of what's happening in the world today, and yeah, I want to fight. I make no bones about that. But I also know if I fight a just cause in an unjust way, I'm going to blow the whole thing. Because when we do that, hey, we only add our own sins to the sins we say we want to correct. So I can understand the wrath of people who are hooked on wrath amphetamines. I can. I can speak to that and try to reason with those who can be reasoned with, and I must also resist the efforts of people who cannot be reasoned with, who want to silence us, who want to control us, who want to take over and become their own big brother. That I can do. Reason with those who can be reasoned with, resist those who have to be resisted. And that is how we fight the good fight against wrath amphetamines. 
Well, this is Christians in a Cancel Culture. If you want to know more about our work, uh, go to joedallas.com. That'll tell you about Cloud Fire Ministries. And if you would like to support this work so we can go on providing free content and uh, doing the work of the ministry that we do at Cloud Fire, we're, we're about helping people understand from a biblical perspective how to deal with sexual issues, relational issues, and social issues, again, in a Christ-like way under the authority of the Word of God. Just go to joedallas.com slash giving, joedallas.com slash giving. If you want to know how you can partner with us in this ministry, hey, we'd love to have you partnering with us. Well, I'll look forward to seeing you again. Christians in a cancel culture, let's remember the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves, if perhaps God will grant them repentance according to an acknowledging of the truth. Let's keep that in mind this week, okay? Great seeing you. God bless.